Everybody's back? All right, so session three, how God gives me gifts. How God gives me gifts. And this is all about what, eighth graders? How does God give me the gifts? Means of grace. Very good. Means of grace. Good job, Nick. Um, so, um, kind of a theme verse. I like this verse. Uh, in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God. Through faith, for as many as you, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. All right. So, this is a change from what your book has. <coughs> Oh, wait, maybe not. Hold on. Um, oh, yes, it is. Looking for answers number one. I have five. How many does the book have? Three? Yeah. You need to readjust your book to look like this. <coughs> and what's really nice is they're on page 12. They give you a lot of space. All right. Number one is on that whole bottom. So... Letter A is right. Letter B just changed to Romans 10, 17. Letter C you want to add. Letter D you want to add. And then, and then the letter C is really letter E. That makes sense? So this is what I did. Here, look up here for just a second. Letter A, Romans 1, 16 is the same. Letter B, I just changed it to Romans 10. And then I added letter C, I added letter D, and then I made letter C, letter E. Just made those changes in my book. <clears throat> because the, uh, is that camera rolling? Did Vicar roll that before he left? Yeah. Yes. All right. So that would really be terrible if I was videoing and then had to teach again. <laughs> I think Vicar would have to teach it on the video. All right, so how does God offer the gifts one on the cross? How does God offer the gifts one on the cross? And why I changed this is that uh, the, the question was just a little deficient. So this, uh, this rounds out the question a little bit better. <clears throat> Romans 1.16. Thomas, look up letter A. Romans 10.17, Evan. 1 Peter 3, Andrew. Matthew 26, Katie, Ethan, Ephesians 1, 7. Okay. Look those up. Look at these foot. gifts Jesus won on the cross. So here's the, here's the picture of what's going on. Alright, I want you to picture this with me. How long ago did Jesus die? Seven days. <laughs> Plus about 2,000 years. Oh. What? what? Can I Seven days? <laughs> All right, that was a good one. That was a good one, Ethan. We're going to have a lot of fun and confirmation this year. Um, all right, so seven days plus about 2,000 years. Um, Jesus died. Long time ago. Long time ago. Whose sins did he die for? Everyone's. Everyone's. Past, present, future. He died for everyone's sins. So on the cross, Jesus wins forgiveness for your sins, right? How do you get that forgiveness? How do you get it? How does it come from the cross 2,000 years ago into your life today? That's a rhetorical question. Don't answer it. That's the question that we're going to look at the Bible about right now. Right? How does his forgiveness come 2,000 years ago into your life today? Life today? Now, I want you to understand this too. There's a lot of your Christian friends... A lot of Christian brothers and sisters in Christ who don't really care about that answer. 
They don't care about that answer. Not that they don't care about God's forgiveness. They just don't care how it comes to you. And so your Baptist friends, your Presbyterian friends, your Nazarene friends, your non-denominational friends would simply kind of say, ask for forgiveness and you have it. That's what they would say. They don't care how it comes. But what's really cool about God's Word is God's Word actually tells us how the gifts come from the cross 2,000 years ago into your life today. And what's, what's better about knowing that is that you never have to doubt if you have the gifts or not. All right, let me say that all again. How do the gifts of God, the gifts Jesus won on the cross 2,000 years ago, come to your life today? If you don't care how they come, and you simply say, well, I ask for them and I get them, what might you have at times in your life about God's gifts? One word starts with a D. Somebody said it. Doubt. Doubt. You might actually doubt if God's gifts come. Well, why would you doubt if God's gifts come? Well, maybe you feel sinful. Maybe you've done something really bad. Maybe you don't believe that Jesus can actually forgive your sins. Maybe your sin is so big that Jesus can't forgive you. If you don't know how those gifts come to you from the cross to your life now, maybe you don't actually feel like you deserve to ask for the gifts. And if you believe that, if you don't ask for the gifts, do you get the gifts? No. No. That makes sense? And so now you doubt whether God actually forgives you, whether God actually loves you, whether you've done something so bad that you have to be outside of God's family. It's about doubt. But here's the deal. If you can look at the cross and say, well, I know how those gifts come into my life, then you never have to doubt because you can look to those um, vehicles, those means that God uses to bring the gifts into your life and not doubt because I know I have them. I can never be too sinful to receive God's gifts. I can never be too far away from God to receive his gifts. I can never have doubt that God loves me and forgives me because I can see how God brings them into my life. Does that make sense? You get that? So a lot of your Christian friends don't really care about answering that question. The problem is that that could create doubt in their lives. All right. So we're going to look at how God delivers those gifts into our lives. Right? How God gives me those gifts. So, Romans 1.16. What does that verse say? Ava? For well, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to All right. So, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. How does God bring me salvation? Through the... Ethan. Cross. Read the verse again. Louder. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Keep reading. <laughs> For it is the power. For it is the power. Keep reading. Of God. Of God. For salvation. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. How do you get salvation? Did Jesus win salvation on the cross for you? No. He died on the cross to save us from our sins. Save salvation. Same thing, Ethan. Did Jesus win salvation on the cross for you? Yes. Yes. yes! Jesus wins salvation on the cross. How do you get it? Through the <coughs> gospel! Oh my gosh, thank you. 
I don't want to say you're a bunch of idiots in front of your parents, but seriously, come on. This isn't rocket science. Do you hear? Did you hear it now? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is God's power for salvation. Well, how, how, where did I get salvation? At the cross. So how do I get the salvation that Jesus wins on the cross? Through the gospel. gospel. And we could also say the gospel is God's word. All right. Do, do, do you, you get that now, right? Yes. You get that now. Okay. So uh, Romans 10, 17, Thomas. Better read this nice and loudly. <laughs> Wait, so faith comes. Faith comes. Faith comes. Faith one at the cross for us, right? Faith is one at the cross for us also. Faith comes. How does faith come from the cross? Finish reading. <laughs> from hearing and hearing through the words of Christ. Faith comes one on the cross. Faith comes through the through the word of Jesus Christ through the gospel through the word God's gifts come through His word. Repeat that with me. God's gifts come through His Word. They are not the answer for all the other ones. 1 Peter 3.21. I don't care. One of you read it. <laughs> Surprise me. Um, we'll just say that you guys messed up and um, <laughs> because I doubt that I messed up. Just saying. Baptism which corresponds to this and I'll save you. Not either Wait. Say that again. The first like five words. Baptism which corresponds No. Nope. Yeah, baptism which corresponds to this, the flood, right? That's it, you're talking about the flood, Noah's Noah's flood. Baptism that corresponds to that flood. Now what? Not as a removal. No, 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 no. Go back. Go back. Start at the beginning. First one. Yes. Okay. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Now saves you. How do you receive salvation? Baptism. Baptism. The salvation Jesus wins on the cross not only comes through his word, but also through baptism. Oh, God doesn't just have one way of giving you gifts, but now he's got two ways of giving you gifts. Yes? Yes. Yes. He can give you his gifts through his word. He can give you his gifts through baptism. Guess where else he can give you his gifts? Oh, maybe the Lord's Supper. Oh. Matthew 26, 28. We've already read this verse, Katie. Okay. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of the forgiveness of sins. The blood of the covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. How do we receive forgiveness and everything that goes with it? Life, salvation? From the Lord's Supper. Wow. And Ephesians 1, 7, Ethan. <coughs> um... Hold up. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Alright. So we have redemption through his blood. blood. It's a passage, it's a passage that's talking about it's talking about um, the cross and Christ's shedding of his blood on the cross, but it's also um, terribly linked I mean, not terribly. Like, 
um, intrinsically linked to the Lord's Supper as well. Right? So, um, through the shedding of His blood, the blood that we receive in the Lord's Supper, His forgiveness comes. Right? Um, so, um, these things, these things. The Word, um, you need to find a space to write this. Oh, you've got space to write this, right? Under the Ephesians 1 7. You can write this out. The Word, Holy Baptism, and the Lord's Supper, then, are called what? The means of grace. The means. The means. That word, that word is like a vehicle, right? So um, at the cross, Jesus, uh, the forgiveness, life, salvation, faith, peace, hope, joy, you know, peace with God, hope in everlasting life, joy, all, all of those gifts loaded up on a on a, 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 a truck. And driven into your heart, right? These are the these are the vehicles or the means of grace. They are the vehicles by which God delivers the grace, the gifts of grace. All of those gifts that Jesus wins on the cross are delivered into your heart and life. All right. So the next question then asks this. What does God provide us through the means of grace? What does God provide us through the means of grace? Number three. Oh, we skipped number two. Just cross out number two. The dumb question. Um, it, it's not a dumb question. I asked it better. So we've already dealt with that. We've already dealt with number two. So just cross out number two and B. What does God provide us in his, and it says sacrament. But again, this question is written poorly. It's a poorly written question. So, what does God provide us in his means of grace? So cross out the word sacrament. Cross out the word sacrament. And number three, what does God provide us in his Means of grace. Means of grace. Then, you have A, and you have B. You don't have a C, do you? No. Write in C, 1 John 1, 9. <coughs> I, I, like, I like writing this question better like this because it goes with number one better. Right? So, um, we'll just rewrite this a little bit. And what we're going to have is we're going to have baptism, Lord's Supper, and the Word. That's what we've got here with these three. All right? And uh, those dashes, uh, some kind of a dash or hyphen, because you're going to have you're going to have a word here uh, in that first blank, and then you'll have a word at the end, too. So, Acts 22, 16. Where are we at? Madeline, that's you. Matthew 26, 28. Again, Katie, are you still open to that? Yeah. Excellent. Leave it there. And 1 John 1, 9, Nick. 1 John 1, 9, which is that third one that you had to put in there on number three. And then, you know, just for the kick, for kicks and giggles, let's go to number four. Becca, Titus 3, 5. John 3, 5. Letter B, 4B. 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 Uh, 4C, Sam. 4D, Ava, 4E, Thomas, and 4F, it's not there, right? Acts 2.38. 4F. You'll need a 4F in a little bit. Acts 2.38. All right. All right, everybody got them? All right, so Acts 22.16 talks about baptism. And what's the gift given, or what's one of the gifts given in baptism? And understand this, this is just like one of the gifts given, right? Um, so partly, partly, um, par partly this is a deficient question because it's not like um, all of them. But you're going to see something really important happen. Acts 22, 16. Where are we? Read it. And now what do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Alright, rise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. Wash. 
Wash away your sins. This is the chief gift given in baptism, which is what? What's the chief gift given in baptism? Forgiveness. 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 So, Acts 22, 16. So, what, get, what does God provide us through the means of grace? Well, in baptism, he gives us forgiveness. Matthew 26, 28, Katie. Okay. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given, it, given thanks... He gave it to them, saying, "Drink all of it. Drink it all of. <coughs> drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins." All right. So, institution of the Lord's Supper. What's it given for? What's the chief gift given? Forgiveness. Is it all forgiveness? I don't know. We're going to have to wait and find out. <coughs> First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, is there a set, is that baptism or Lord's Supper going on there? Nope, that's just the what? Word. That's just the word going on. And... What's the chief gift given in the word, Katie? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Very good. We kind of see a pattern here. What's the chief gift given through the means of grace? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. The chief gift, one on the cross, is forgiveness. And that's loaded up on the truck called the means of grace, baptism, Lord's Supper, and the word, and driven into your heart and life. And because... <coughs> Because you have the assurance of your baptism, the assurance of the Lord's Supper, the assurance of God's Word, do you ever have to doubt that you have the forgiveness Jesus won for you on the cross? Do you ever have to doubt it? No. No, you never have to doubt that those gifts are for you. Never have to doubt it. All right? That makes sense to everybody. Now, this is kind of weird, and I don't know why it does this. Well, I kind of know why they do this, but question number four is weird because question number four zeroes in on baptism. Is this class about baptism? No. No. But question number four zeroes in on baptism, and I think it's, I think it's because they want to give you this idea that it's not just one gift that's one on the cross for you. Right? There's more gifts of God, one on the cross. The chief gift is? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. But there's more gifts, one on the cross. And so, baptism actually gives you more than just forgiveness. The Lord's Supper gives you more than forgiveness. The Word of God gives you more than forgiveness. Right? So the Word of God, the Word of God gives you forgiveness but also life and salvation, strengthening of faith, the Holy Spirit, peace with God, hope in eternal life, joy in living as God's people, right? I mean, the Word gives you lots of gifts. Baptism gives you lots of gifts. The Lord's Supper gives you lots of gifts, all right? And that's why I think this question, because it's really easy, it's really easy to bounce around Scripture and say, oh, baptism, another gift, baptism, another gift, baptism, another gift. It, it's... It's a little more, you know, it doesn't, there's no passages that say, and the word gives you, I don't know, joy, and the word gives you peace, right? I mean, it's there as you read the scriptures, it's, it's obvious, but we would have to do a lot more reading and a lot more mining and a lot more discussion to get at, at the, the kind of proof that the word gives you all of these gifts. All right? And kind of the same thing with the Lord's Supper in a way also. So baptism, I think they just use as an, as an easy example of saying, see, baptism, one of the means of grace, gives you a whole bunch of gifts, not just forgiveness. And now, use that as a pattern and understand the Word gives you a whole bunch of gifts. Oh, and the Lord's Supper gives you a whole bunch of gifts. 
And that's why they zero in on baptism. So that's what we're going to do. Notice I've added an F. Is that the only one I added? Yeah. Did I change any of them? No. no. All right. I added an F, though. So add the F. And Titus 3.5, gift given in baptism. So he saved us through the washing. What's it talking about? <laughs> baptism. baptism. So what's the gift given in baptism? Save us. Yeah, and what's the longer word? Salvation. 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 Sa saves the verb salvation is the noun, right? Um, just like um, justify is the verb. Uh, justification is the noun, right? And so we can use, it just depends, a lot of these words. Um, redeem is the verb, redemption is the noun, right? So all of these church words kind of have um, atone. Atone is the verb, atonement is the noun, right? All these church words are kind of verb and noun driven. John 3, 5. All right, so unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the... Oops, salvation. Whoops, forgot that. Um, so what does baptism, born of water and the Spirit, what do you receive? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Entrance into the kingdom of God. All right, eternal life. Salvation again. I mean, they're all... It's kind of all related a lot of times. Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the uh, in newness of life. So what do we receive in baptism? Eternal life. Eternal life! A new life, an eternal life. That's exactly right. And it's actually kind of both. New life now... As a child of God, right? Third use of the law shows me how to live as God's child. I have a new life. It's called Christian. Right? I'm no longer a pagan or an unbeliever. I am Christian. That's my new life. That's my new identity because of baptism. By extension then, I also have eternal life. Right? Because that new life is being part of God's family and gives me new life or eternal life. So it's really kind of both of those. It's new life now as a child of God, as Christian, and then it's also eternal life. It's why, um, I don't know if you knew this, um, way, 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 way back, um, and it, well, even Roman Catholics, Roman Catholics um, uh, did this for a long time also. It's kind of a practice that's falling out of practice, but um, um, people who were baptized took Christian names. When they were baptized, they actually changed their names. Right? That's kind of what's going on with Saul. When Saul becomes Paul, right? Um, Saul, Paul is actually part of his actual name, but he changes his name around and takes a new first name, is essentially what Paul does. I think his name was like Saulus, Saul, Saulus, Paulus. Um, you know, did you know that? Yeah, um, I believe that's correct. Uh, do you know Vicar? Um, I, I believe that I believe that that new name is just really kind of a, an inverse of, of his name, new identity. It's where I'm pretty sure it's where the name Christian. You know, you've got friends probably named Christian. That that name Christian probably comes from that, right? What what better what better name to take on when you're baptized than Christian, right? It's an identifier. That's probably where that name comes from. But a lot of Roman Catholics practice this actually for a long time. Some probably still do. They would give like they would give like a a, a name, and then um, they would either either take the middle name and make it the first name at baptism, or they would just give a new name at baptism, and and uh, that would be the name that they would identify with. Uh, that's interesting. That was a interesting question my dad asked one when my husband just got his citizenship. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have a middle name though, he's a Juan Martinez. And oh. he took on a middle name when he got his citizenship, he picked one. But he was given a middle name because they do that because he's Roman Catholic in Mexico. In Mexico, that's what they practiced. And 
but so have David. They just never put it in his name. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. So <laughs> David was his Christian name. Yeah. 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 Um, so I guess that's the op that's kind of the opposite. That change um, early on. The Greek people who were getting baptized took on Greek and Roman people took on a Christian name and were identified with that. Roman Catholics, can, as the church grew, they continued that tradition with a middle name. And that's what it is. They would give a um, a middle Christian name um, as part of it. It's also why, like uh, in some countries, like Roman Catholics will have like four or five names because, and one of them will be their Christian name. Um, so they'll take on a whole bunch of family names and other names, but one of them will be their baptized Christian name. So, um, so, and that's that mark of the new life, right? I'm no longer, I'm no longer pagan Greek person, but now I am. I don't know, Paul, and I take on a Christian name. I think it says, it was his Latin one, I'm guessing that maybe he changed it because he became the apostle to the Gentiles, but he went with his Roman citizenship over his right. Hebrew roots. Right, probably, right. Um, but I think that's still kind of a, a mark and identifier, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Galatians 3.26, who's got that one? All right, nice and loud, Ava. You failed me all day, you read really softly, so, you know, with gusto, come on, it's God's word. For in Jesus Christ you are all sons of God throughout faith. Alright, for in Jesus Christ you are all sons of God. Um, and let me... Uh, uh, is it 27 also? 327 also. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ yeah, so um, you have you have become sons of God because of what? Verse 27 tells us, right? Because of baptism, right? So you have become sons of God. You've been put into a Christian family. You have put on Christ. You have become a Christian in Holy baptism. All right. And then first John three one. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. I don't like that one. I probably should have crossed it out because it's not explicitly holy baptism, right? But um, I think this is, is that, this one's actually a better one for um, the Word than anything else. You know, let me just look at this again. First John three. <clears throat> yeah, the uh, the kind of tenuous baptism connection down in verse nine. It talks about uh, being born of God, right? So there's a lot of that born of water in the spirit language, um, raising to a new life, and I think that's probably why they make that connection. Um, but this isn't actually a specific baptism baptism connection. Plus Galatians 3, 26 and 27 gives us that sons of God, children of God thing. So um, Acts 2, 30, 38 gives that one. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, so repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, right? Well, 
uh, we could put that one, but we're not going to put that one because that was already, we have that, right? But what else? And receive? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Gift of the Holy Spirit. Gift of the Holy Spirit. So, number five then. Number five. When Jesus began or instituted, we call it instituted the Lord's Supper. This is a fancy word for began it, started it, um, put it into practice. Uh, he was celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples. What is the Passover meal? <clears throat> Do you know the Sunday school story? Kind of. Kind of. When... Does the Passover happen? What's the big event in the history of God's people? It comes in the book of Exodus, chapter 12. What's the big event, Andrew? It involves when them, there are slaves in the Hebrews. They are slaves where? In Egypt. In Egypt. And God brings... Who comes to deliver them? Moses. Moses. God sends Moses to deliver the people of Israel from Egypt. All right, so we have Abraham living in the promised land, and Jacob, and Isaac. And Isaac has 12 sons, and the 11th son is Joseph. And Jacob loves Joseph more than the other sons. And um, the brothers get jealous, and they uh, sell Joseph into slavery in Egypt and tell Jacob that he was eaten by a wild animal, right? You remember the story? All right, and Joseph goes down to um, Egypt and works for a guy named Potiphar. And everything he does, God blesses and he succeeds. And then Potiphar's wife accuses him of adultery, coming on to her, raping her, whatever. And he has to be thrown in jail. Potiphar probably doesn't believe the story. That's probably why he's only thrown in jail and not executed. So he's thrown in jail. And even in jail, God blesses him. And he makes money for the jailers and the guy who owns the prison, because prisons, prisons were... Um, Prisons were run. Um, prisons were run by independent people to make money. They were money-making endeavors. And so uh, uh, Joseph helps the guy who owns the prison to make money, and he succeeds. And then there's a baker and a um, wine bearer, and they have dreams. And Joseph interprets the dreams. And the one guy gets killed, just like the dream says, and the other guy is restored to Pharaoh's service. Um, but they doesn't remember Joseph. And then later on, Pharaoh has dreams, and. Uh, uh, Joseph comes and interprets the dream. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. Joseph is made governor second in charge of all of Egypt. You remember the story, right? And then, and then Joseph finds out, um, or his dad finds out that he's alive, his brothers, right? They all move down to Egypt. Seventy people in the family move down to Egypt. And over the next 400 years, that family grows into, like, I don't know, somewhere like a, a million to two million people. A couple million people uh, are Israelites living in Egypt. And the Egyptians go, holy crap, there's a lot of foreigners living in our country. We should make them slaves. And so the Egyptians make them into slaves and um, put taskmasters over them, and the people are in bondage. And they cry out to the Lord, and uh, God sends Moses, burning bush, right? God calls Moses. Moses goes down and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. No. And so God says, there's going to be ten plagues, and then you will let my people go, and then there's plagues, right? The first plague is? Um, water turns to? Blood. Then frogs, then, uh, what is it? Gnats, flies, uh, boils, uh, death of the livestock, uh, darkness, uh, hail was in there, I missed the hail. Locusts. 
Hail is in there. And then um, the last plague is death of the firstborn. firstborn. Well, does God want the death? Um, does God want Israel to suffer death of the firstborn? No. No. So he gives them a way so that their firstborn do not die. And that is to take a lamb. 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 What kind of a lamb? Perfect. A perfect lamb. No spots on it. No crippled leg. No, you know, cut by a, by a wolf. Right? A, a perfect lamb. And then they were supposed to sacrifice that lamb. And do what with the blood? Paint it on their door frame of their house, right? And then they're supposed to eat that lamb um, with some uh, bitter herbs and with unleavened bread. Unleavened bread means bread with no leaven. yeast. Yeah, no leaven, thank you. No <laughs> yeast. <laughs> leaven, leaven's a fancy word for yeast. That was good. Um, no, no leaven. Um, no yeast. And uh, it was all done so that they could leave Egypt quickly, right? That's what's going on that's the skimming of of chapters 12 to 14 and so that night that night the angel of death came through the land of egypt and killed all the firstborn of man and livestock but anybody who had blood painted on their doorposts uh, were spared the angel of death right so number five when jesus instituted the lord's supper he was celebrating passover meal with his disciples God said, hey, keep celebrating this meal year after year after year after year. You celebrate this meal to remember what? What were they supposed to remember? What yeah. were they celebrating year after year after year? Ethan? Um, how they got, they, how they were freed from slavery. That is exactly correct. Well done. Um, they remembered God's deliverance from is or, or of Israel from a slavery in Egypt. It was meant to be a lasting meal to remember how God, with a mighty hand, delivered Israel from Egypt. Turn to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. This answer isn't exactly intuitive. We have to read this verse and then make just a quick step to the answer. But I think you can do it. What do we remember when we receive the Lord's Supper? What do we remember when we receive the Lord's Supper? Read 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, Andrew. Or did you have a question? Oh, no, go ahead and read it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you will claim the Lord's death and the Lord's house. All right, so what do we remember when we receive the Lord's Supper? We remember Jesus' death. death. Now, wait, don't write that down. Because there's more to it than remembering his death. What did Jesus' death do for us? He saved us. From? Our sins. Yeah, so here, look at this. And look at the parallel that's going on. Oh, wow. What do we remember when we receive the Lord's Supper? God's deliverance of us from slavery to sin. When we look at the whole story of the Passover, the angel of death, the tenth plague in Egypt, that entire story is pointing ahead toward the cross. cross. That entire story points ahead towards the cross. And, and uh, we call this, there's a special word for this, it's called typological prophecy. There is a type in the Old Testament that points ahead toward a greater fulfillment in the New Testament. So the type of deliverance is a physical deliverance from slavery in Egypt in the Old Testament. But it points ahead toward a greater fulfillment, a spiritual deliverance from sin and death for God's people. So the Old Testament 
Physical deliverance from slavery in Egypt points ahead toward a greater deliverance for God's people. The deliverance from sin, death, and the power of the devil. You hear that? Does that make sense to you? That's what's going on. Hey, Troy. I think there's like uh, two or three. If they're still there, there's two or three of those green things in the altar guild room on the table. Thank you. Yep. Um, that's our florist, if you didn't see him carrying flowers. Um, so that's, that's the parallel going on. And so when Jesus is celebrating Passover meal with his disciples, his disciples are sitting there going, oh, hey, this is our, our yearly remembrance of, of God delivering our people from slavery in Egypt. And Jesus says, that's right, but tonight I'm going to do something new with this meal. I'm going to do something new with this meal. And, and what's the new thing that Jesus does with this meal? He says, this isn't, this isn't just bread and wine, but he says, this is my body and my blood. And it's not just to remember deliverance from Egypt, but it is to actually give deliverance from Evil. sin, forgiveness, right? It is, it is not just bread and wine, but it's body and blood of Jesus. Not for deliverance from physical slavery, but for forgiveness and, and, and uh, deliverance from sin and death. You hear that parallel? Right? That's what Jesus does. Jesus always, Jesus does that several times. He does the same thing with baptism. Did you know, did you know that the Jewish people baptized, baptized all kinds of things? They did... <clears throat> baptize simply means a ceremonial washing. The, pe the Jewish people ceremonially washed themselves so they could go to the temple. The priests ceremonially washed their garments. They're, they ceremonially washed the basins that they used at the temple and the other, other things they used at the temple. They ceremonially washed all kinds of things. But what Jesus does, right, he one-ups it. John the Baptist comes and he starts baptizing people for the forgiveness of sins. That had never been done before. Yeah, more than just a ceremonial washing, this washing actually forgives sins. Now John's baptism wasn't Christian baptism though, because John's baptism was before Jesus died and rose again. And so John's baptism only pointed ahead towards Jesus also. But now Jesus, when he, right before he ascends into heaven, he says, go and make disciples baptizing. How do we make disciples? How do you bring people into God's family? How do you give people forgiveness, life, and salvation? By baptizing. You mean that stuff that the Jews did ceremonially? Yeah, but now we're going to do something new with it. And so Jesus does that. Jesus takes things that were common and does something new. This Passover meal, very common, happened all the time, year after year, but Jesus does something new. All right? So that's, that's, uh, that's what's going on on the night that Jesus is betrayed. Now, compare and contrast the Passover meal with the Lord's Supper. So we've got a bunch of similarities. <coughs> and I don't know how to do this in a good way. Or in an easy way. So, if you draw two columns, or you could do similarities first and, and then differences at the bottom. You should have plenty of space if you write small enough. I've got like five similarities and, and uh, like uh, three, uh, well, two, probably two differences. All right? So, first one, that there was bread in the Passover meal and there's bread in the Lord's Supper. They both use bread. Um, dovetailing off of that, there's wine used in the Passover meal, and there's wine used in the Lord's Supper. Those are similarities. And if uh, if your family comes, if your family comes to our Passover meal um, this year, you'll see some of these similarities um, happen. It's a it's a really kind of a cool thing um, to take part in. All right. So then, um, both both the Passover meal. And the Lord's Supper give 
deliverance. <coughs> There's a deliverance that happens. When they ate the Passover meal, there was a deliverance from, from slavery in Egypt. When we eat the Lord's Supper, there's a deliverance from sin and death and the power of the devil. Both of them used a perfect lamb. Both of them used a perfect lamb. And both of them used the blood of the lamb for deliverance. Both of them used the blood of the lamb for deliverance. Now, there's some, a couple of key differences, too. What kind of deliverance did the Passover meal give? Um, from, slavery. from slavery. A physical deliverance from slavery. What kind of a deliverance does the Lord's Supper give you? Spiritual deliverance. A spiritual deliverance. It gives forgiveness. Very good. The Passover meal, how often did they get delivered from Egypt with the Passover meal? Um, once. Once? Yeah, very good. That was, that was a simple answer. Very good. Uh, Passover meal was a one-time deliverance. What about the Lord's Supper? It happens every time. It happens every time. It's continual deliverance. It's deliverance over and over and over and over again. Very good. A uh, cool picture on page 14. It's about Jesus' baptism, so um, we're not going to um, take the time to look at it. Um, um, but that's, that's kind of the roots of the Lord's Supper. So, next time we get together, we're going to talk about some really important, really important ones. We're going to talk about what's called real presence. We're going to talk about the chief chief gift given in the Lord's Supper. What's the chief gift given in the Lord's Supper? Forgiveness. Good. And then, and then we'll talk about the other blessings given in the Lord's Supper also. So that snapshot that we did with baptism, we'll do that with the Lord's Supper. Alright? So those are our topics next time. And if you haven't taken a picture of the homework, I'll flip it up here in a second when... Sam I am is done writing. Everybody get the homework? All right. Do not fail me on the homework. Um, I would I would especially I would especially um, uh, invite you, I would especially invite you to um, the questions for day two preparation. Those aren't those aren't very long. There's only like uh, 28 questions or something like that. I would invite you to read those a few times, the questions and answers. Um, whenever an answer, uh, this is the other thing about the catechism, if you didn't realize this, um, like question, uh, I don't know, 352, if they give an A by one answer, that means there will be a couple of Bible passages and then a B. And some Bible passages and maybe a C. So make sure you look for additional answers in um, in that in the block of questions. Um, so 318 is a good example. 318, and then it has A with an answer, and then you have to flip and say, okay, uh, B with an answer, and then you go down and oh, there's a C also. All right. So make sure you pick up all the answers as you read. Um, the questions and answers. All right? Any questions? All right, you guys are really pretty in tune today. I really appreciate that. I know it's a long haul. Three hours is a long haul for a class like this. Um, I thought you did uh, great. So we will plan on um, August 11th. We will plan on August 11th. All right? All right, peace. Have a great day. Do you want the room set?